Welcome to ECE 165. This is lecture 11, where we will be discussing an introduction into arithmetic building blocks. Note that the lecture after this will also discuss this. It will review some of the material from today and then introduce a few new concepts as well. So what do we mean by arithmetic building blocks? These are blocks like adders, subtractors, multipliers, dividers, things like this. Anything that's doing actual arithmetic computation on Boolean representation of numbers is really what we're talking about here. So obviously these play a pretty critical role in the design of computing systems. Um, in addition, a lot of these uh, arithmetic building blocks end up limiting the performance of digital systems. And so therefore it is important for us to understand how to design these and particularly how to design them well for fast high speed operation. So in this lecture, we're going to cover a few different things. We're going to first uh, obviously go through an overview. Uh, we're going to go through how we do single bit addition. Uh, and then once we understand how to do single bit addition, we'll uh, learn how to do multi-bit addition. And furthermore, we're going to learn how to do this very quickly uh, so that we can really optimize our data path speed. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll then talk about how to build uh, multipliers and other types of uh, arithmetic logic functions. Now, for those of you uh, reading along at home, uh, chapter 11 is uh, very useful. The authors do actually a very good job of describing uh, the operation and optimizations of arithmetic logic circuits. So here's a, a picture of a generic microprocessor. We have our, our controller. That's where it kind of decodes our, our, our codes that are fetched from memory. Um, and then what usually happens is once we fetch some instructions, uh, you know, something needs to happen. And oftentimes that is some sort of arithmetic function, an, an addition, a subtraction, uh, a multiplication, something like this. And, and so that's really the, the focus of this uh, lecture today is, is how do we build some of the basic building blocks that would go into this data path unit? So this slide here just summarizes what we what we kind of just talked about. Uh, again, we're really going to be focusing on the design of the data path unit. Particularly today, we'll be focusing on the adder. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll focus on multipliers, shifters, and comparators, and, and, and things like this. So let's just go back to, to first principles. Uh, let's say we have two binary numbers and, and we want to add them together. Well, well, how do we do that? Well, if we go back to you know, grade school, we actually are taught how to do this in base 10. Um, let's just refresh ourselves how to do this, but this case in base two or in binary. Um, so when we're trying to add two numbers, then we just kind of do it in a step-by-step -step fashion. One. Uh, uh, plus zero, uh, you know, is equal to, to, to one. One and one uh, is really equal to zero, but we have to carry a one, right? Then one plus one plus one, and that's equal to one, carry the one. One plus one, zero, carry the one. One plus one, zero, carry the one. One plus one plus one is one, and then carry the one. Okay, so you know this isn't uh, too uh, complicated here, but uh, going through this step by step is really the the most basic way that we'll learn to actually build our uh, 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 arithmetic logic circuits. Now, one thing I want to explicitly point out here is that we call these the carries, and you know I, that's exactly as I was describing it uh, when I was doing the operation here, and particularly I'm going to call them C outs. We're going to use that variable later on. And this bottom result here, this is called the sum. I'm going to label that with a variable called s. Okay, so these are some uh, variables that we're going to use uh, moving forward in this lecture. So what we'd like to do is transition from what we did uh, in that prior example there to logic gates. Okay, and so what we can do is we can kind of go ahead and, and build a truth table. Uh, we can think of the, the top line in that previous equation as input A, the bottom line is input B, and what we want to do is generate some functions that create C out and S, or the carries and the sums uh, on a bit by bit uh, sequence here. Okay, so when A is zero and B is zero, well, that's the easy, easy one, C, C out is zero and sum is zero. Now when a is 0 and b is 1, then what we say is that there's no carry and the sum goes to 1. The same situation it happens when a is 1 and b is 0. Okay. Now when a is 1 and b is 1, that means that we have a carry out and our sum is 0. 
Okay, so we actually call this a half adder uh, because we don't have a carry in that we have to deal with this in, in this half adder. So let's just take this step by step and understand how the half adder works first, uh, and then we can transition to, to learning what we would call a full adder, which then has the carry in uh, bit uh, as well. So we can look at this truth table and we can immediately you know, realize that, hey, actually these two functions are fairly um, straightforward functions. S is actually equal to just the exclusive or of A exclusive or B, right? Because S is only one when either A or B is one, but neither both at the same time. Similarly, C out only goes high when both A and B are one. So that's just an AND gate. Okay, so we can go ahead and, and, and make some gate implementations. They look as follows. We have an XOR gate, A, X, or B. That creates the sum output. A and B creates C out. Okay, so this, this is great. This is, uh, this is useful when we're computing a bitwise sum when there is no carry in. Now, if there's a carry in, we need to go to what we would call the full adder. So this is what we call the full adder. We have A and B and C in, and we want to generate C out and um, sum. Okay, so again, we can go through the same exercise and, and develop a truth table. When all the inputs are zero, well, we don't get anything at the output. It's just zero. When we only have one input going high, uh, either A, B, or C, but only one of them at a time, then that means the sum is 1 and the carryout is 0. So we can just go ahead and, and fill in the uh, entries for, for the table for that situation here. Okay, very good. So what happens when there's two of the three inputs are high? B and C in, for example, or A and B? Well, in that case, sum out is 0, but we have a carry. Carryout is 1. Okay, so we can just go ahead and fill that in for the rest of these uh, 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 entries here. 1 and 0. Okay, that leaves us with one uh, final condition, and that's when all three inputs are 1. And of course, what that results in is sum becomes 1 and C out becomes 1. All right, so now we have a complete logic table here. Why don't we go ahead and try and compute what these functions would be? Now, I'd like to an, an optimized uh, solution here. Um, so the, the best way to do this is generally to draw a Carnot map. So I'm just going to draw a Carnot map. I'm going to put inputs A and B on the top here, C on the bottom. Carnot map looks something like this. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1. OK, so let's just go ahead and, and, and fill this out. Uh, this is uh, specifically, I, I should point out, this is for the sum function that we're trying to compute this for. Okay, so the sum function is, is 1 when uh, C in is 1 and the rest of the guys are 0. When B is 1 and everything else is 0. When uh, A is 1 and everything else is 0. And then finally, when everything is 1. Okay, so <laughs> unfortunately, this is the worst possible result for a Carnot map. There's literally no simplifications we can make here. So, but what we can recognize is that this is actually a special case of a Carnot map. We actually can just write down the function by inspection. It's actually just A, X or B, X or C. Okay, so that's actually fairly straightforward. Um, designing three input XOR gates is a little challenging, but uh, not impossible, and, and we should know how to do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the uh, C out function. And again, I'm going to draw a Carnot map. Hopefully we can get a better uh, optimization out of this Carnot map. Zero, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, and one. Okay, so let's take a look. When is C in, or sorry, C out? I should specify here, C out. When is C out one? Well, it's equal to one when B and C in are both equal to one. Maybe there. It's equal to 1 when A and C in are both equal to 1. That would be here. It's equal to 1 when A and B are equal to 1. And finally, it's equal to 1 when everything's equal to 1. OK, so this is looking a little bit better. We have some options here, at least, uh, to do some simplification. 
So in this Carnot map, I'll probably uh, circle these terms, I'll circle these terms, and those terms. So we should have three uh, min terms in our equation here. So we can go ahead and just write those min terms down. C out is equal to AB or BC or AC. Okay. So we can simplify that. That's AB. And I'm going to, there's multiple ways you could have simplified this. I'm specifically choosing this simplification for reasons that will become clear hopefully a little bit later. Is equal to C and A or B. Now, we can also write this expression in a slightly different way. Uh, we notice that C, yeah, C out is equal to 1 when the majority of A, B, or C are equal to 1. That is, if we have two or more of our inputs equal to 1, then C out will be equal to 1. Uh, and that just happens all the time. Okay. So what we can do is we can use these, uh, uh, these expressions here to go ahead and design a full adder. Now before we do that, let's just take a step back and, and see, well, where would we use a full adder to, to actually build a, 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 you know, a multi-bit adder, okay? So the simplest way to do this would just be to take a, a full adder. So, so one of these symbols here, that would be a full adder. That's just what we der derived in the prior slide here. And just chain them together. This is literally exactly what we were doing when we were doing our bit by bit summation. We would take A1 and B1, we would sum, we would create the sum output and then the carry, which would then allow us to compute the sum and the carry for the next bit, for bits two, bits two and then bits three and then bits four, okay? So this is uh, you know, the, the simplest possible way to build a multi-bit adder. Now, what we're going to con concern ourselves a lot with in this lecture is how can we speed up this computation? Right now, the critical path, which is the, the, uh, the path through this uh, collection of gates, uh, really you know, goes from our inputs through our carry chain and then to the output. So I'm going to call that P critical path. Okay. So when we're designing adders, we generally want to design them to be extremely fast. You know, we, uh, we want to put them in a high performance microprocessor. If we have to wait for all these carries, um, it could take us a long time. And therefore, instead of clocking at two gigahertz, maybe we can only clock at one and a half gigahertz or something like this. And our customers won't like that as much. So we really want to learn, and we're going to learn in this lecture, how we can try and optimize that critical path. But for now, let's try and better understand why that critical path arises and what specific uh, input vector that corresponds to. So let's just go through this and let's think about it. What would be the worst case input? Well, the first thought, if you don't think about it too carefully, might be, well, let's just put all the inputs to one. You know, If all the inputs are zero, the output zero and, and nothing really happens. But if all the inputs are one, then that ought to be a worst case. Um, so let's just go go ahead and, and, and go through this. So let's say our A inputs are all one. I'm going to use uh, some slightly different colors here to make everything clear. Our B inputs are also equal to one. And let's just, for the for the purposes of this, this example, assume that our, our carry in is, is zero. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just go through this uh, in a bit by bit fashion. Okay. So one and one generates a zero at the at, at the output with the carry. And then this carry uh, one 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 that generates a, a sum a sum one with a carry sum one with a carry sum one also with a carry. Now, what's interesting here, uh, and, and you know, I highly encourage you to think about this very deeply, is that this is certainly not a worst case scenario. And, and the reason is is that as soon as that first carry in, as soon as C one is generated. Um, or rather, C1, C2, and C3 are all generated at the same time, right? All of the inputs are one, and so therefore, all of those carries are generated all at the same time, regardless of what the carry in is, okay? So all of these carries are generated all at the same time, and therefore, the, the carries can't change depending on the previous carry. We already know that they're one, and so what we would say here is that the critical path is actually equal between all of these paths here. So these are all critical paths. Secret. 
secret. Okay. So this is not the worst case scenario. So what I'm going to suggest is let's take a look at a, at a different scenario that may not be entirely obvious at the start, but is actually representative of a much uh, of the worst case scenario here. So let's say we have an A input, it's uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, and our B input is equal to 1, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and compute uh, what happens in this case here. Again, let's just assume that uh, that, that carry in is zero here. So one and one, that creates a zero at the output, and then that creates a, a carry. And then this carry uh, adds with, with the uh, B input here to create zero and then a carry, zero uh, and then a carry, and then finally this uh, carries to the, or makes the sum at the output, and the output carry is zero. Now in this case, the carry two and carry three could not compute or, or let's just focus on carry two for now. Carry two could not compute until carry one was ready. Because prior to carry one being there, carry two was actually going to be zero. Similar thing can happen with carry three. One and zero um, nominally will generate a zero carry out. We had to wait until carry two was ready in order to generate carry three. So therefore, in this case, what I'm saying is that the critical path actually has to go through this entire carry chain before arriving at the output. So let's call that the critical path here. So what we can then say then is that the, the, the worst case propagation delay of an n bit adder has to go through n minus one uh, carry stages, TP carry, propagation delay carry, plus one sum stage, obviously we need to get to the output, so plus tp sum, and this is order n, okay? So for an n bit adder, we need to wait, you know, on, or, on the order of, of n cycles. If, if we increase n, it's kind of a linear function, we get an, uh, a linear uh, increase in delay. So this input vector is, is indeed the worst case. Now there are a couple different input vectors that give very similar results, but uh, this is one example of, of the worst case input vector. Okay, so that's how we would combine several of these full adders together uh, in order to make a multi-bit adder. Let's go ahead and uh, explore how we would actually implement at the transistor level a single unit of a full adder. Now when we do that, I want to uh, bring up an interesting property that full adders happen to have. It turns out that full adders are symmetric functions. So in other words, a symmetric function means f of the complement of the inputs is just equal to the complement of the function with regular inputs. So this is what we would call a symmetric function. So we, uh, we're going to exploit this, exploit uh, to design what we're going to call mirrored logic gates. Okay, but before we do that, um, or, uh, you know, let's just take a look at how we would actually build the transistor level implementation of our circuit. So let's first start with the sum. So we know sum is equal to A, X or B, X or C. Okay, we can go ahead and write that out uh, explicitly. That's uh, A, B bar, C bar, or A bar, B, C bar, or A bar, B bar, C, or a, B, C. Now, if you don't believe me, uh, you know, you can go ahead and, and draw your truth table for, for an exclusive OR with three inputs, uh, and you can verify that this uh, is indeed the correct function. Okay, so this is a, uh, it's, it's not an inverted function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by drawing the PMOS uh, circuit, uh, and then I'm going to exploit that mirrored property uh, I, I uh, introduced earlier to then go ahead and design the NMOS network directly. It's actually going to look exactly the same as the PMOS network, only because we have this mirrored property. Okay, so again, this is not an inverted function, so we can go ahead and just by inspection draw the PMOS network. I'm gonna start uh, with the following uh, transistors here. 
these are PMOS devices. And I'm going to start by implementing this term here. So that's going to be A bar, B bar, C bar. Okay, because this is PMOS, and, and so we want to use the, the opposite uh, gates or the opposite signals on our gates. Then I'm going to go ahead and, and generate another branch here. So one of the other midterm, min terms. This is going to be A, B bar, C. Let me connect these together here. Then what I'm going to recognize is that uh, the other two min terms are actually, we can kind of do some factoring here uh, and exploit some of the uh, existing transistors there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an output from here, and bring that down, and then I'm going to implement the PMOS device, which is then going to connect here. And I'm going to connect that to uh, input B. Then I'm going to do a similar thing over here. Do a PMOS there, connect over there. And there we go. That actually completes the description of or, or the schematic for our pull-up network. Now this this term here, this is actually our sum out. Okay. Now, because we have a mirrored circuit or, or the mirrored property for this full adder, instead of having to design the, the dual uh, pull-down network, because and only because we have this mirrored property, we can actually just go ahead and, and replicate exactly what we drew up above, but in this case in uh, NMOS devices. And, and again, I want to emphasize we can only do this because we have a mirrored uh, uh, function that we're implementing here. Okay, so let me just go ahead and complete this drawing. C, B bar, uh, A. And, and by the way, there's a reason why I'm putting the, the C's and the A's and, and, and stuff where, where, where they are actually going in, in the circuit. We'll talk about that a bit later. Some of you may be able to guess why already. So let me just complete this picture here. It's a little bit messy here. Let's make sure we have enough room. And that is input B. Okay, very good. Now, uh, let me explicitly point this out for your for the purpose of your notes. This is mirrored due to the inversion property. And only because of the inversion property. You can't do this in the general case. Now, I'm going to make a note here. I want to place the input C. I guess we'll call it C in, near the output. Why do I want to do this? Well, I recognize that if I'm building a ripple carry adder, then the carry chain is on my critical path. And as we learned from our earlier, earlier lectures on combinational logic, uh, that, that carry in is, is on the critical path and will likely be arriving last. Inputs A and B will probably arrive much sooner and therefore A and B can pre-discharge or pre-charge some of the internal nodes, and by the time C arrives, it can, it can uh, finish the computation much more quickly. So I say place C in near the output for speed. Now one final note about this, so uh, you, you can count, we uh, and end up requiring 16 transistors to actually implement this. There's three... Okay, so let's take a look at the implementation of our carry function. So we know that the carry function uh, C out is equal to A, B, or C, A, or B. Let's go ahead and implement this. And again, we can leverage our uh, mirrored property or our inversion property to, to mirror our actual circuit implementation. So I'm going to go ahead, again, this is not an inverted function, so I'm going to go ahead and just implement the uh, uh, pull-up network by inspection. So we have A or B and C. All right, so that's uh, A bar, because we remember these are PMOS devices, B bar or C bar. Or we just have B bar or A bar or sorry, B bar and 
a bar. Okay, and so that's the pull-up network for the purposes of com computing C out. Now again, and only because we have the inversion property of the function that we're implementing, we can go ahead and implement the mirrored uh, schematic for our pull-down network. And again, I want to emphasize that this is only because we have our uh, inversion property. So that would be A bar, B bar. You can't do this in, in general for all functions. A bar and B bar. Okay, very good. So that computes, uh, or that completes the uh, diagram for the uh, carryout circuit. Again, we'll note that this is uh, mirrored due to inversion property. Okay, and finally, we'll we'll note that this uh, requires ten transistors. All right. So what I'd like to do now is, um, is, is make a few notes. The previous design used 32 transistors. And you might say, well, 16 plus 10 is not equal to 32. Well, that's when we include uh, inverters because we, we don't have exclusive access to non-complemented uh, inputs. So let's use Boolean algebra to try and simplify the equations. OK, so we know s is equal, the sum out is equal to a, b bar, c bar or A bar, B, C bar, or A bar, B bar, C, or A, B, C. Well, let's make a, a few uh, uh, factors here, A, B, C, or, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a, a little step here, but uh, trust me that it works out, A or B or C, and A bar, B bar, or A bar, C bar, or B bar, C bar. Now, I recognize that this is not a, a, an obvious step, but uh, if you go ahead and multiply this all out, you will see that these uh, functions are the same. Now, what's really interesting here is that this function here, that's actually equal to C out bar. Okay, so this is very interesting. What we can do then is we can compute the sum as ABC or C out bar. Uh, and A, B, A or B or C, okay? So what we're doing here, the purpose here is we're going to share terms to reduce complexity. Okay, so in other words, what we can do is once C out is computed, then we can leverage that or we can reuse that in order to compute uh, the, the sum output, okay? So let's take a look at, uh, at uh, what this would look like uh, from a circuit level. Now, so basically what we're showing here is on the left and in red, that is the, um, the carry out, or in this case, carry out bar uh, circuit that will generate C out bar. And then once C out bar is um, computed, then we can go ahead and compute the sum. And so we specifically want to compute C out bar first because, of course, C out bar is on the critical path and we really want to um, try to uh, optimize its speed. And then some, you know, we're not as concerned about the speed of some because it's not always, it's not a determining factor on the critical path. So in homework, in, in one of the homeworks here, we're going to explore how to size uh, this uh, C out bar circuit. What I'd like to talk about now is how do we size the uh, uh, circuits for the sum generator? And we're, we're going to include a discussion on that on the next slide here. So what we recognize is that the critical path goes from C in to C out. Uh, so of course, uh, for, for this reason, we want to place our C in transistors closest to the output. Uh, and, and let's just uh, write this in for your notes here, since C in is on the critical path, 
it will arrive. It usually arrives last, which means that A and B may have already charged or discharged uh, internal capacitors to help speed things up, okay? Um, so what we then want to do is we want to size the CN path to be a little larger than the minimum size. It, it's really on the critical path, so we want to uh, size it a little bit higher for some speed uh, boosts here. Now, all the other transistors are not on the critical path, okay? So what we'd like to do then is we'd like to set their sizes all to one. Now, this will make an asymmetric gate. Uh, the input capacitance is going to be different for different inputs. But, you know, maybe that's okay because, you know, it's not on the critical path. We're not as concerned about really, really optimizing it. So then what that looks like is that all of these gate sizes would just all be equal to 1. 1, 1, 1. This is the easiest gate sizing you'll ever have to do. Okay, very good. So let's take a look. We can look at some uh, so, some uh, layout uh, of these, uh, this new gate here. Um, and we can see that with some careful tricks, depending on what kind of process you're using, if you're allowed to do horizontal poly or not, um, then uh, you can actually really optimize the uh, size of this structure, which is important because, you know, a 32, 64-bit adder, it's going to need 64 of these, and you might need a bunch of these in your system. Uh, the, the, smaller, the smaller you can make your full adder size, uh, the better uh, you will be. Okay. So... Before continuing on to how we can uh, uh, really optimize these, I want to point out a small optimization opportunity. And that is that, you know, we re recognize that the full adders are completely inverting functions. Um, and therefore, they have the mirrored property and, and things like this. But what we further recognize is that when we built this kind of more optimized uh, full adder, it actually generates carry out bar, not carry out. So what we can recognize is that, well, why don't we generate uh, alternating full adders that have complementary and then non-complementary inputs? So in other words, our full first full adder here operates as normal. It generates carryout bar, which then goes into a complemented version of the full adder. Now, because it, it's a, 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 the, the full adder has this inversion property, this actually works out okay. And then, of course, carryout will not be carry out bar, it'll just be normal carry out, which after which we go into an, our normal cell, after which we go into our odd cell, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very easy way to exploit this inversion property to save a couple inverters of gate delay uh, in, in your system. Now, this doesn't help a whole lot, but you know it doesn't hurt. It, it certainly does help. Now, before uh, continuing on into how we really optimize these things, I want to point out, you know we've learned how to do adders how do we do subtractors? Um, well, it turns out that a subtractor is really an adder, but we're adding a negative number, right? And if you'll recall from Boolean algebra, a negative number is nothing more than the complement of that number plus one, okay? So we can use this to our advantage, and any time we build um, an adder, we can also build a subtractor with a few small modifications. So what I'm going to draw here is, is, is a, is a four-bit adder so this is a we'll draw four full adders here that talk to each other or that are connected in the normal way all right full adder uh, and our, our carries propagate through here and then our sums come out this way this is sum zero sum one sum two sum three then I'm going to have input A3, A2, A1, and A0. Now, instead of just putting in input B here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a little mux. And I'm going to input either B3 or B3 bar into the adder. And we can do that for all of our uh, full adders here, B2 or uh, B2 bar. Similarly over here, B1 or B1 bar. And then finally over here, B0 and then B0 bar. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a signal called add or uh, I guess add bar or subtract. Okay, 
And so if add is um, is one, or rather add bar is zero, then we will select our non-complemented input and things will, will just kind of work as, as per usual. Okay, and so this signal kind of goes to all of these different uh, uh, muxes here. But let's say subtract goes one, then what I want to do is I want to choose the complemented inputs. But when I'm doing uh, subtraction, I need to use the complemented inputs plus one. Well, it turns out we have a very easy way to do plus one, we just feed that subtract signal to our carry in uh, of our first stage there. Okay, so let's just go ahead and, and write that for your notes here. Add one uh, to B using C in. So that's a very easy way to do it. And then at the output, uh, we can just, uh, you know, we have to deal with overflow and, and things like this when we're building uh, adders and subtractors. So what we can just do is uh, we can uh, XOR. Uh, the output, the carry out uh, of the, the last, second last and last cells to create an overflow uh, bin here. Okay, very good. So that's, a, I just wanted to give a very brief uh, introduction on how we would do subtraction. So now I'd like to get to a, a new topic um, related to how we can design adders uh, much more quickly. Okay, and we're going to introduce three definitions, uh, generate, propagate, and kill. I put an asterisk here because this is the name of my new band uh, and you're not allowed to take it. Okay, so, so what are we uh, exactly looking for here? Um, well, let's just go through these definitions and uh, do a little bit of derivation and hopefully why we take this kind of strange new terminology, uh, why we take this approach will become clear later on. So what we can recognize is that if um, A and B are one, then that means C out is always going to be equal to one. Or, or in other words, we always generate a carry out. Okay, and so therefore we say generate, our definition for generate is A and B. If A and B are both one, then C out will always be equal to one. It doesn't matter what C in is, C out will definitely be equal to one. Now we, we have another case that we would call propagate. Now if either A or B are equal to one, then what that means is that whatever C in is, that's going to be what C out is. If C in is zero and A or B are, are or A one of A or B are equal to one, then C out will be zero if C in is zero, C out will be one if C in is one. So in other words, we say propagate is equal to A X or B. Okay, and finally kill, is equal to one, which implies that C out is zero always. That only happens if both A and B are zero, or rather A bar or B bar, or A bar and B bar are equal to one, okay? So these are a little bit strange definitions. Why, why are we doing this? Um, hopefully that will become clear uh, momentarily. So we can go ahead and, and construct a truth table. Uh, instead of computing C out and, and sum, we can go ahead and compute generate, propagate, and kill. Um, and uh, I've, I've gone ahead and just filled out the truth table for you already. Um, so let's just go ahead and, uh, and see what these functions look like. So let's take a look at generate. Generate is only equal to one when both A and B are equal to one. So that's an easy gate to implement, A, B, that creates generate. Um, interestingly, this is just equal to C out in a half adder. It's just an interesting uh, idea here. And then furthermore, uh, propagate is equal to the XOR of A or B, which also interestingly just happens to be equal to sum in a half adder. Okay, so let's say we wanna go ahead and, gener er, and compute what generate and propagate are. When we do that, we'll then go ahead and also compute, uh, you know, we, we eventually want to be able to compute the, the sum and, and the C out. And we can do it in the following way. So, so basically what, what we're looking at here is we have a smaller truth table, generate and propagate are our inputs, C out and S are our outputs. And if we take a look at this, uh, S is equal, our sum output is equal to our carry XOR with propagate, okay? Uh, and, and C out, is going to be equal to, well, if generate is one, then, then we know for sure whatever happens elsewhere, doesn't matter, we know that there's gonna be a carry out. Or 
if propagate is one and carry in is one. Okay, so this is going to prove to be very useful to help improve um, to help improve speed. Okay, it may not be obvious yet, uh, but uh, bear with me as as we go through some of this analysis. So what I like to do is 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 uh, uh, kind of just take a slight detour and, and describe the operation. We can build full adders also using transmission gates. We've seen in lecture and, and in a few other places that transmission gates can be uh, very compact ways to implement functions. But of course, there's issues with uh, you know you have to regenerate the values and and, and use uh, 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 full transmission gates and things like this. Okay. So what we can say then is we can build a very, very compact way to build, uh, to create our propagate signal, that's A, X, or B. A um, X or transmission gate implementation can be uh, a very nice way, a very compact way to build an X or. Then we can use that, that uh, propagate signal to generate our, you know, another X or signal, C, X, or P, uh, in order to generate our sum. And in this case, we also can generate C out, I'm gonna call this C out bar, uh, that's equal to P uh, C bar or A bar P bar. Then I'm going to double De Morgan that to try and do some a little bit of simplification here. Um, and so I'm going to just uh, compute the results down here. That's going to be equal to P or C and A or P all barred, which is equal to A P bar or A C or C P all barred which is equal to A, A, B, or A bar, B bar, or A, C, oops, A, C, or C, P, all barred, which is then equal to A, B, or C, P, all barred, which is just equal to G, or C, P, all barred. Okay, so, so uh, I've just gone through that derivation to show you that, yes, indeed, um, the function that I've described here is uh, the proper way to, to compute what the carryout is. So in some cases, going to this transmission gate uh, type of structure can be a very efficient way to build your full adder. So why are we interested in, in, in doing these generates and propagates? Um, well, if you go back to those expressions for generate and propagate, what you'll see is that uh, generate and propagate depend only on A or B. They don't depend on, on the carry. And, and, and we know from ripple carry adders that the carry is really the critical path, right? Or is on the critical path. And every time we compute a new sum or, or a new carry out, we have to wait for that original carry in. Now by computing generate and propagate, what that means is that we could presumably compute all of them all in parallel without having to ever wait for a carry. Um, and so that's the general idea here. Uh, we're going to try and leverage this property to make sure that we can uh, compute all of these things in parallel rather than having to sequentially wait for some rippling carries. So let's go through a, a very basic example to, to really uh, realize what we mean here, okay? So let's go ahead and, and compute the, the first carry in, uh, or the first carry out of our circuit, we'll call it C1. That's equal to generate, if, if generate uh, from those first two uh, bits are, are zero with order bits, A0 and B0 are both equal to one, then that means uh, we're going to generate and therefore G0 is one and that, and that directly goes to, to C1. Um, or if propagate zero is equal to one and the carry in, in this case I'm calling it C0 is equal to one, then we know carry out of our first stage will be equal to one. So what we can do then is we can go ahead and compute C2 in a similar fashion. That's equal to G1 or P1, C1. Now, we know what C1 is. We just derived it uh, up here, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and fill that in. G1 or P1 and G0 or G0 or P0, C0, okay? So you'll notice that carry two here is computed without any regard for what carry one actually is. Okay, so let's just go ahead and write that down. Uh, so we've computed C2 without needing 
carry one. All right. So we can kind of take this a step further. C3 is equal to G3 or uh, P2, C2. And we know what C2 is now. And, and so that's equal to G3, um, or P2, G1, or P1, G0, or P1, P0, uh, C0, which is equal to G3, or P2, G1, or P2, P1, G0, or P2, P1, P0, uh, sorry, C0. Okay, so again, we're able to compute C3 is computed without needing C1 or C2. Okay, so you can kind of get the idea here. This is going to be a very powerful way in which we can compute all of these carries in parallel without having to wait for the ripple coming through the prior stages. Uh, so that's really the main idea. We're going to return to this exact uh, derivation here when we talk about carry look ahead adders. But for now, let's, uh, let's take a step back and, and look at a slightly more simple class of, of adders and build ourselves up to what we would call a carry look ahead adder. So first of all, let's just go through a little bit more uh, formal definition. So we know what generate and propagate are for the base case. Uh, we say, you know, GI is equal to AI, BI, PI is equal to AI, XOR, BI. And this is just a kind of a bitwise um, uh, operation. At the base, at, at the very end of the circuit, uh, G0 or G0 is equal to just CN. And P0 is just equal to zero. It's, it's, there's never propagate uh, for that first stage there. Uh, and so what we can do is sometimes we're interested in, in, in learning what the generate is across a group of bits. Uh, and so we can say that generate I through J is equal to generate I through K or propagate I through K and generate K minus one through J. Okay, and so what does this mean? This means i.e. a group generates if the MSB generates or if a lower bit generates and it propagates to the MSB. So that's really we, me, what we mean by, by that formula there. Now, this is admittedly getting a little bit confusing. Uh, it'll take you a little bit of time to digest what's going on here. Um, and uh, a, a very good resource if you want a little bit more explanation for what's going on here is actually the Weston Harris book. They do a, a quite good job at describing this. Uh, again, PI through J is equal to PI through K and PK minus one through j and then we can finish this sum off it's p i x or g i minus one to zero and again if this is not clear and, and i don't expect it to be uh certainly not off after the first pass i highly recommend that you go to the textbook and and, and uh, review this material so let's take a look at how we'd actually uh, uh synthesize our uh, uh adders using this new generate and propagate structure so the first thing we do is we set it up, or we tee it up. We, we uh, synthesize all in parallel uh, G and P for every bit. And, and we can do that right off the bat. We don't have to wait for any carries or anything like this. Okay, so that's step one. Step two is we're going to do some sort of group PG logic. Uh, so this is our, so some sort of carry chain where we, 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 we create our carries. Um, and so the question we're going to ask ourselves is, is how to generate these values? Uh, this, is, this is empty right now. Spell properly here, empty right now. So what we're going to learn is, is how to fill this in with, with actual logic. But once we are able to, to create all of these generate uh, functions here, then we should be able to, to uh, finalize our sums. Sum i is just equal to ci minus one, 
XOR PI, okay? So one of the basic ways to do this is to do the following. We have uh, all of our generates and propagates generated uh, in parallel. Uh, and then what we do is we recognize uh, this formula here, and I apologize, the box it should be a, a dot symbol, an AND uh, symbol. Then what we can do is we can actually just go ahead and compute uh, all of these individual generates. Uh, and then what we get is, is a critical path that goes through here, it creates that generate, goes through here, creates that generate, goes through here, and then to the, to the output. So this is our T critical path here, okay? So this is actually basically doing the same thing as we've done before. This is, this is a, you know, we're using generates and propagates, but we're really designing a ripple carry adder here, okay? So we actually haven't won anything just yet. Um, and so, and I apologize, actually, the critical path should actually go through the XOR gate, not through the, the carry out, although I, I guess one could argue uh, either or there. Okay, so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a, what I call a ripple carry PG diagram. Uh, and what we're really in, uh, showing here is that on the Y axis, if you will, the Y space, represents time or, or delay through the circuit, okay? So we can think of uh, this uh, setup phase where we, where we create our, all of our uh, uh, propagates and generates, we'll, we'll call that some uh, PG uh, propagation delay, okay? And then once we have that PG propagation delay, we have to go through this network of and ors to create all of our generates and then uh, go through our um, XOR gate at, at the bottom to generate our sum. And so this is the delay of going through that AND OR structure. So our AND OR structure. Um, or in other words, this is computing GI to zero is equal to GI or PI GI minus one to zero. Okay, so if we go ahead and sum all this up, this means that we have to wait one uh, generate and propagate uh, delay at the start. We have to wait through n minus one and ors, and then we have to wait through an XOR gate. So again, this is a, a linear uh, increasing delay with the number of bits available in our circuit. Okay, so this is not an optimal uh, scenario, at least for the purposes of uh, being able to do these additions very quickly. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, formalize a little bit more what we mean in these, in, in these carry ripple PG diagrams. And furthermore, let's make it a little bit more sophisticated. This will allow us to design slightly more complicated cells. So what we showed in the previous PG diagram is these little gray cells or gray boxes. And what we're really computing here is just a generate. So we look at, at, uh, at the current generate for that bit, uh, as well as previous generates and propagates and see if any of those are one, then the generate out will be one. Now we can get a little bit more sophisticated here and we, we can generate or we can create both generate and propagate signals out of that uh, same infrastructure there, okay? And so that's what we'll call a black cell. We're gonna get back to these, uh, uh, this new notation momentarily. But before we do that, I'd like to go through a, a brief example of uh, what we call a carry skip or a carry bypass adder. And the basic idea here is as follows. Um, so we could say, uh, or rather, this is, this is one possible approach that one could take. Okay, so let's say we have a bunch of uh, propagate and generate cells all at the input. And again, all of these can be computed uh, simultaneously. Propagate generate, propagate generate. So we have A naught, B naught, A1, B1. I really should say A1 or A0, B0, by the way. Uh, A2, B2, and A3, B3. So again, all of these generates and propagates can be computed in parallel. And then they will input into what I'm just gonna call here uh, loosely uh, a full adder. It really actually is our, our network of uh, and or cells. Um, but uh, let's just, uh, for simplification, just call it a full adder. So that's P0, G0, P1, G1. P2, G2, 
and P3, G3. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, we have our CN, and that propagates through all of our circuits here. And then finally, we generate S0, or S0, S1, S2, and S3. Okay, so let's make a few notes here. So what we are doing is we are computing P and G for all bits in parallel at once. Okay, so the idea here, the idea that we're going to propose is if P three to zero is equal to one. If you know we compute all of these uh, 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 um, propagate signals, uh, so what we mean by p3 to 0 is p3, p2, p1, and p0 are all equal to 1, then Cn will propagate directly to C out. So the idea here is let's pre-compute P3 to 0 to speed things up. Let's see, let's see what happens if we can do that. So this is uh, what will go into the, uh, the architecture of the carry skip adder. So I'm going to very quickly uh, redraw that uh, previous diagram here. Uh, I'm going to be a, a, a little faster, uh, a little looser. I'm not going to draw the inputs and, and uh, uh, everything, but uh, just refer back to that previous diagram if, if anything's unclear here. Then we have our full adders, our loosely defined full adders. Okay. And so that comes through here, through here, through here. And so what I'm going to say is that if we know that all of the propagates are 1, and this is our CN, then what we can do is we can just take CN and pass it through a MUX. So either all of our propagates are not 1, and therefore we just take the regular C out, or they are all 1, and we do that, of course, by, by putting it through some sort of uh, uh, for input uh, and gate, this is P3 to 0, and then it generates C out bit 3. Okay, so in other words, if P3 to 0 are equal to 1, then C in skips directly to carry out 3, saving time for the next stage. So what's the worst case now? The worst case is now when propagate of 0 is 0, and then all the other ones are 1. OK, so this was an example for a 4-bit case. We can go ahead and, and, uh, and, and generalize this for an n-bit case, as would be shown here. So here we have a, a collection of four input uh, or four input uh, uh, carry skip adders. We go through that mux, and uh, if all goes according to plan, or or if we get the what used to be the old worst case, then all these carries would just kind of skip through these muxes to the end. So let's take a look at the uh, carry skip uh, diagram here. Okay, so again we still have the delay to go through, or the carry skip PG diagram, I should specify. So in this case, the, the normal uh, scenario happens. We still have to go through our, our propagate generate. We still have a, an XOR delay at the end here. And we now have a new delay uh, of a MUX. We've added a MUX here, so, so it has to go through some cells. Now, in the old case, in the ripple carry case, the worst case delay would go this way. And we kind of just keep going. This would be the uh, uh, T crit uh, ripple carry. All right, but in this new case, we have something slightly different. All right, so what the worst case is is we have to go through these cells, and then if 
we get our propagate um, uh, function computed correctly, then we can actually just skip through a bunch of these and then go through this last one and then to the output here. So this is our critical path here. Okay. And so what this is implying is that you know, we may not end up being able to do the carry skip, but at least we can, if we're able to, we can pre-compute some of these things in advance. Okay. So what that means is that our overall uh, delay here is, of course, we have to go through the propagate and generate. Then we have to go through two n minus one and ors, and then k minus one muxes, and then one final x or. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, again, I do encourage you to go into the textbook and 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 take a, another read. Uh, a lot of this stuff is is very uh, terminology driven. Um, and it just takes a little while to, to digest and, and, and sink in. Okay. So here's uh, some uh, uh, results here. Um, for very low number of input bits, we're plotting uh, delay versus the number of input bits of your adder. For very low number of input bits, the carry skip actually has a higher delay. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to add a whole bunch of muxes and stuff if you're only adding you know less than four bits together. But as soon as you start adding more than uh, four bits uh, or four to eight bits, depending on the technology and the speed of your gates and things like this, then what we can say is that the carry skip or the carry bypass adder starts to really outperform the normal ripple carry adder. So this was kind of the first taste of what we could do to help speed up our adders. It turns out that there's a lot better things that we can do to help improve this even more. So let's take a look at our carry lookahead adder. This is what we uh, uh, um, hinted at before. So what we do is, in the prior case, in, in our ripple carry PG case, we're basically computing propagates and generates, but we're only doing it kind of one bit sequence at a time, and therefore we have to wait for these ripples. So the idea here is let's use what we'd call a higher valency cell and combine the propagate and generates from multiple blocks together. Okay, and if we can do that, we can avoid waiting uh, for some of these carries. So what we're going to, to say here is we're going to calculate both group generate and propagate as opposed to just generate, which is what we were doing before, to avoid waiting for a ripple to determine if the first group if the first group generates a carry okay so this turns out is going to be a very efficient way to do this so we can take a look at our carry look ahead uh, PG diagram, and again, uh, we have the same PG delay at the top here, we have the same XOR delay, but really what we're doing is we're trying to compute uh, the uh, group uh, propagate and generate across, you know, in this case, four bits, all at once. And, and we can do that in parallel right at the start. We don't need to wait for any ripples to come through. So we do that all right at the start, and then we can kind of compute an answer and then as soon as that answer appears, then the other ones are doing that in parallel, and so we can go much faster. Um, so this directly relates to this uh, formula we, we wrote down earlier, C out K was equal to GK plus PK, and GK minus one plus PK minus one, and you know this, this kind of recursive formula that uh, we derived earlier. P0, C0, and you know, however many brackets we need at the end there. So in this case, our delay is TPG plus TPGN plus N minus one plus K minus one, T and OR plus the XOR, okay? So it turns out that we're getting much, much better uh, at, at going through this, this uh, uh, PG diagram and our critical paths are really starting to shrink here. So just for completeness, this is what that uh, higher order cell looks like. It depends on how many inputs it's, it's bringing into its, in, to, to its input in order to compute the group, generate, and propagate. So 
if the look ahead adder was good, then what we can start to do is we can look ahead our look aheads. Okay, so that may be a weird uh, concept, but uh, there's this kind of very nice uh, uh, theory and a whole bunch of collections of different types of adders that really leverage this. And the key thing here is that we've changed from an order n to order log n. Uh, and th therefore, for very large bit width adders, uh, we can really start to gain some advantages uh, by using some of these techniques. Uh, so, so a lot of these uh, adders are called the tree adders. The pokey stone adder is a great example of a, uh, a tree adder that uh, really does achieve very, very fast operation. Um, and if you want to learn more about this particular adder, you can look at the book. And there's a whole bunch of other types of adders that, that achieve uh, very similar uh, types of performance specifications. So that's it for, for this lecture. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, summarize some of the things we've talked about today uh, in the next lecture and then move on to uh, multipliers and, and other types of shifters and arithmetic uh, logic